Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Acom's College Prep webinar. My name is Ashish, a high school senior and an Acom Youth Ambassador. As, a, as an ambassador, I'm a member of the Planning and Organization Committee for this event, but as a high school senior, I'm already in the middle of my college admissions process. I would like to know more about it and every and the college freshman lifestyle, and I, would, I myself have come with some questions that I would like answered, and I hope you have as well. Hi, I'm Amin, an Acom Youth Ambassador from Austin, Texas, and a rising freshman in high school. I was part of the planning and organizing committee for this event. I'm very excited to be here to learn about the college admissions process as I start my high school journey. I could learn about the different courses required to join a specific program and any other extracurriculars that could learn, help along the way. We have a fine panel of college students from a variety of different colleges and majors to share their experiences with us. We have collected your questions from when you registered and you can submit new questions using the chat box that will be answered during the Q&A session. We will have deep dives in your areas of interest, so you can ask any specific questions that you may have in those deep dives. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you a bit about ACOM USA. ACOM USA supports the ACOM Foundation, which is committed to better uh, rep reproductive, maternal, newborn child, and adolescent health in rural India to ensure no neonatal and infant deaths occur to preventable causes. So far, ACOM USA has raised over $700,000 with over 200 service projects and over 9,000 volunteer hours and over a milli millions of mothers and children are, have benefited. Thank you for contributing to a worthy cause. Now let's finally kick off the main event by letting the panelists introduce themselves, starting with Parvati. Hi everyone, uh, so glad to see everyone. Uh, my name is Parvati, I'm a rising senior at Johns Hopkins University where I major in molecular and cellular biology and public health, and I'm originally from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Hi everyone, um, I'm Priya, I'm Parvati's sister. Um, I'm also a rising senior at Johns Hopkins University, um, majoring in molecular and cellular biology and public health, uh, and I'm from Baton Rouge as well. Hi everyone, my name is Sonia. I am going to be a rising senior at Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, I'm majoring in biology and environmental studies, and I'm joining you all from Virginia Beach, Virginia. Awesome. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chetan Singlereddy. I am a rising senior at UNC Chapel Hill studying computer science and business administration. Super excited to talk to everyone about the college admissions process. So thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Mala Kumar. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I'm a rising junior at Washington University in St. Louis, and I'm majoring in Spanish with two minors, one in biology and another in global health and the environment. Hi everyone, my name is Shreya Shivitsen. I'm a rising junior at the University of Michigan. Um, I'm majoring in microbiology with a minor in French, and I'm joining you guys from Detroit, Michigan. Hey everyone, my name is Ajar Alapati. I'm about to be a junior at Tulane University in New Orleans. Um, I'm studying computer science and economics as a double major, and I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Hi, I'm Abed Balsareddy. I'm going to MIT and I'm a, going to be a rising freshman. My major is math with computer science. I'm also from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Hi, guys. I'm Freya Bunsell and I'll be attending University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, majoring in aerospace engineering, and I am from Austin, Texas. Hi, everyone. I'm Bhutika Nair. I'm a rising freshman at Purdue University, and I'll be majoring in visual effects compositing and I'm currently in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Welcome again. Um, we're so excited to have you all here. Uh, this is our agenda for the day. So first, we're going to be discussing pre-college, which is basically like your freshman year um, to junior year of high school, um, and then applying to college, which happens during your senior year of high school. And then there is usually um, an adjustment period <laughs> because high school and college are quite different. So we'll be talking about adjusting to college and following that with involvement in college. Um, next, we'll have a discussion on scholarships um, followed by a generic um, Q&A. And after the Q&A will be the deep dive breakout rooms. And so we have four breakout rooms. Um, one of them is arts and foreign languages. Uh, another one is pre-med. Um, another one is computer science, math, engineering, business. Um, and then, of course, there you might not have all your interests in majors figured out, which is completely fine. And so the fourth room will be undecided. So we can start off with pre-college. OK, hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, we're starting off with um, pre-college. Um, and to start off that, we're going to be talking about academics. 
So your academic performance in high school is definitely um, a very important part of your application um, to college. Um, that colleges will spend a lot of, um, like will give a lot of importance to. So in terms of like the courses that you can take, um, I would suggest to definitely try to take challenging courses as much as possible. So this could be AP classes, um, IB classes, even honors classes, um, and you know some uh, high schools even have like dual enrollment classes with colleges. So any sort of class that um, is challenging is a really good idea to take. And this is for several reasons. Um, one, if you take the class and you do well, it really shows colleges that you can handle challenging coursework, which is a major factor in being able to do well in college. Um, also, if you take classes that are on the college level, it gives you um, good exposure to that level of material. Um, and so in one way, some, some um, universities can give you college credit for classes like AP classes, which is really nice. Um, it lets you be like one step ahead when you start. And, um, you know, if you're trying to take like a double major, it can give you more flexibility or it can even help you graduate early, which can really save a lot of money. So that's really um, helpful, um, but it can also demonstrate to the college, um, whether you get credit or not, that you're able to handle that level of coursework um, and uh, which is a great thing. Um, you don't really have to worry about what exactly your school offers um, compared to other schools, but just take advantage of whatever you can um, based on this, what your school offers. Um, and then with all that said, also be sure to find a balance. Um, when you're taking these challenging courses, you want to be sure that you're also doing well in them. So, you know, take them, but be sure not to overload yourself um, so that you're able to do well in the classes that you do take. Yeah, so like Priya said, it's important to balance your time and prioritize activities during high school. One way to get involved is to join as many activities as you can in your freshman year. Then as the years progress, you'll find your niche and passions, allowing you to manage and divide your time better towards the activities you really enjoy. Another point to keep in mind is to try different and new things. Your extracurriculars don't all have to be tailored to your, towards your intended major or field. If there's a club that you feel very passionate about, then seek competitions by talking to sponsoring teachers or fellow club officers for opportunities, and also look for local external organizations related to your strongest extracurricular. The same mindset applies to athletics. Try to strive for the highest levels of competitions in the sports that you enjoy. And the last point on this slide is about summer activities. So the summer is a great time to get involved in things that you might not have time for um, during the regular school year. Um, so it's also a great time to sort of start planning and thinking about college. So for example, if you're gonna go on vacation anywhere, um, I don't know how many people are doing that right now, but it's a good time to go look at the colleges that you might be interested in, get a feel for like that place, um, how college life is like. Um, so that's definitely something you can do into the summer to even if you're early in your high school career. Um, and then in terms of like activities that you can do, um, you it depends, you can do like many different things. So for example, you might wanna get like a summer job, um, Maybe you could do some research at your local university if that's something you're interested in um, or do some sort of like independent project. Um, during that time, you can also volunteer with organizations. Um, and then also depending on your field or career choice, there are um, like specialized programs that are often offered by colleges where you can like go and learn about your, um, you know, the career that you want to or like general skills like leadership. So those are all great activities uh, to do during the summer. Um, and also, um, I think it's a, the summer is also a good time to maybe practice um, and study for your standardized test. If you find that you don't have much time during the um, school year to do that. So um, yeah, those are all just possibilities of things you can do during the summer. Um, so we got a question from the chat. Uh, what activities were you personally involved in in high school? My main involvements in high school were robotics, National Art Honor Society, um, 
recycling organization and a nonprofit that I founded for art therapy. In addition to those main commitments, there were also smaller ones where it was just other clubs and volunteer work. Um, I would say that you should also have kind of like a balance, right? Um, so I did, I focused on volunteering clubs like Key Club or Beta or National Honor Society. So I was involved in all three at some point. Um, and then leadership. So I co-founded my a chemistry club at my school. Um, I was the officer like at my Indian club and for like other, you know, small um, officer board positions. Um, if you like doing competitions, like I was part of Mu Alpha Theta um, and Science Olympiad. Um, and then, uh, you know, you can still be involved in anything that would help your career. So like I did a lot of hospital volunteering um, and I had like a job at Mathemuseum. So, you know, um, things, these are the things that will like help you stand out um, besides your grades, because a lot of people have great grades. So you want to find something that you enjoy. Um, and that is also, you know, a little bit unique. Um, and uh, that colleges will favor for you. So to start this slide off, um, I know a lot of parents out there are probably concerned, how does COVID affect the application process? And I'm here to let you know that now more than ever, the holistic application process has been enhanced. So what that process is, is that admissions committees will look at your child beyond their GPA, beyond their ACT scores, beyond their SAT scores. So who is your child outside of school? So, um, well, so that could be what clubs are they in? Um, do they do volunteering outside of school? Um, like Parvati said, are they involved in anything related to their major that's outside of school? Um, and so the reason this process takes place is because um, there's many people who can get good grades or can get the highest score, but this allows for a fair chance because some people have more strengths in other areas and everyone has their weaknesses. But when you look at everyone at the um, same level playing field, it allows for, it allows for a fair applicant process. Um, but not only this, um, like I said before, if you have your strengths, you can use this process and stand out when you're when you're doing your application. You want to make sure that you're emphasizing the parts of you that you know are unique and that other applicants probably don't have. And this will help you stand out to those schools and hopefully get you selected. Yeah, and speaking of the application process, um, one name that's been thrown, thrown around a lot is the Common App. And I know for myself, the first time I heard it, I thought it was like an actual app on your phone that you used it for. So um, let me explain a little bit more about that. So what is the Common App itself? The Common App stands for Common Application, and it's called that because a lot of colleges um, accept it. So basically, you do um, the Common Application, and you fill it out, and each college has sometimes they have their own supplements to that but the whole purpose of it is instead of doing let's say 10 different applications to apply to 10 colleges now you can only do one common app with a little bit extra for each individual college and send it all at once so it's much more convenient now um the common app uh like i said before most schools take the common app including all the ivies but some schools do have their individual applications and they don't take the common app um, this could be an individual school, such as MIT or Georgetown, or it could be a school system within a state, such as like the University of California system. They have um, a single application as well, except that applications for each of the schools, and you check off which schools you want to apply to within that. Um, additionally, there's also the coalition application, which is worth mentioning, and it's similar to the Common App in the sense that it's for the purpose that you can use it for many schools, but it's used less often and most places um so you don't have to worry about choosing most people most colleges accept both but there are some exceptions where they only accept the common app or they only accept the coalition app so within the common app itself like let's go through some of the components you know of course you have the standard details like your name email and major they have a courses and grades um, section available, although this isn't always used because, but you know that in some way or the other, the colleges can get your courses and grades, whether your school sends a transcript 
or you type in manually to the Common App. That's also there. Additionally, um, there's an honor section. So this section means um, you type in five, only five of the achievements that you want to show, and they classify it by school, regional, states, and national um, status. And there is limited space. So like, you know, you're thinking about all the activities you've been doing in high school and all the awards and honors you've been getting. Um, the Common App has space for only five of those um, top five honors that you want to list. And there is space, but like there's limited space you can't keep on typing forever on that. Additionally, there's a testing section, which is pretty self-explanatory in terms of um, AP, IB, uh, SAT, ACT scores. The next section is the activity section, and it's similar to the honor section in the sense that it's limited to 10 activities, and um, there's limited space to type in each of them. So they, they make sure that it's limited to ensure that, you know, you don't just go up signing for every activity just because it looks good for college. They make sure these activities are meaningful to you and that you're actually committing to them. So in that sense, um, they for each activity, you have to describe it um, in the sense of like what grades you're involved in it, uh, how many hours per week and how many weeks per year you're in it, uh, your different roles and like a description of what you do for the activities. So um, that is the activity section. So note that it's not the best idea to just sign up for a ton of random stuff. One, because you only have space for 10 activities, but two, because you really have to explain like what you did in those activities. And you just say that like, you know, I was just signed up for the club. That's not really showing you committed. Um, additionally, there's the Common App essay. And uh, most people are familiar with this. You choose from one essay or you choose one of seven prompts on the Common App website. And it's up this year already. You can just switch it up. Uh, this is an uh, important part of it because, you know, this is one of the only places that they call it, the college can actually see you for who you are. And that's why it's important that this essay reflects you, like you yourself. And usually the questions are pretty good about that. They give pretty personal questions or they let you decide and you're able to um, express yourself. But that's a really important part of the Common App. Additionally, there are university questions. So like I said before, all, everything that I said before is the main, the common part of it. And then um, some universities decide to add additional questions when you apply to their university. So um, one of these, exa one example of additional question are supplemental essays, which you might have heard. Um, these could range anything from short answer, like lots of short answer questions, like a few words, or to a um, few big essays, because I know when I was doing my applications, um, one school had a lot of like one word or one phrase short answer questions. What's your favorite movie? What's your favorite song? And it was arranged. So another school had like a mix of short answer questions and like essays and another school had like only essays. So um, the supplemental essays vary and that's up to the college because, you know, it's up to the college to even require the common essay and some colleges don't have any writing supplements. You're, you're giving different opportunities um, throughout your application to show and make yourself stand out. And um, I'm what I what I thought in my application process because I recently graduated, so this is very recent. Um, I'm pretty sure it was my common app essay that made me stand out and made me get selected into all these schools. And so, um, like I said before, you're given seven prompts and you can choose from them. And um, being able to write in those prompts shows them that you can be given a prompt, which is, you know, restricting, um, but you're able to share a personal experience. Um, and through that personal experience, you, were, you should be emphasizing um, situations you found yourself in your lifetime that you are certain other people may have not experienced or something that will catch the admission committee's eye. So for example, um, in middle school, I lived in Mumbai for five, for four years. So I wrote about um, I, I my school made me a uh, volunteer. We had to volunteer every year in uh, new groups. And so when I got to eighth grade, I chose to volunteer with um, a group of uh, sexually trafficked victims. And um, they they went to the school next uh, next door. And so I wrote about my experience of um, creating this relationship with them and what it felt like to, it felt like something that was beyond volunteering. Like that wasn't even the word to describe it. It felt like a real sisterhood. 
and so because that's a unique experience um because like how, how many people do you think would be applying to mumbai from all these schools so that's something that i could emphasize um and that shows like beyond your grades and stuff um, why a school should pick you and so like abe was saying before there's also supplemental essays and i also think that was something that got me selected because for like he said it, the types of questions you get for supplemental essays varies and a lot of mine for the schools i applied to were specific just for my major so i'm i was going into visual effects compositing so it's a lot of art space questions um and so my questions were like why are you picking this major like what what got you interested into this and so even there you can talk about your experiences um if you were involved in some kind of art museum before if you've been editing for a long time if you have a lot of technical experience that's a place where you kind of have bragging rights and um, you can hopefully get the admission committee's attention okay yeah i guess next i can talk about standardized testing um so um just like quick disclaimer, I, I applied before COVID, so I'm not entirely sure how um, the COVID situation has impacted how colleges view standardized testing. So if um, anyone who has applied during that um, wants to clarify anything that I'm saying, like feel free to do so after I finish. Um, okay, so yeah, so the main tests um, that you will be submitting your scores for are gonna be the ACT or the SAT. And um, the vast majority of universities will accept either one. So I would suggest just taking whatever your school offers or whatever is easiest for you, whichever one you typically get a better score in. Um, and yeah, so with the in the SAT program, a lot of times students will also take the PSAT program, and that's something you need to do the PSAT exam, which is something you need to do if you want to participate in the National Merit Scholars Program. Um, so then you'll take that exam, and if you qualify to become a sem semi-finalist, I believe, then uh, you will be required to take the SAT after that. So you might end up taking that exam as well. Um, but yeah, just general advice for any standardized, standardized testing, I really recommend um, making sure you're taking good quality practice exams, um, usually from like, the official practice exams offered by uh, by the college board are usually best. Um, and just making sure you're reviewing all of your mistakes, having a clear strategy for each section that you've thought out and practiced a lot before you actually go in and take the actual exam. Um, when it comes to third party prep materials, just understand that not all prep, book, prep books are created equal. Sometimes they're really not gonna help you. Sometimes the strategies in those books aren't that good. So you're just gonna have to try and figure out what's best for you. And also there's a wealth of information online. So just do a lot of research, see what's worked out for other people um, and get advice from other people who have done well. Um, okay, yeah, I guess, I guess I can hand it off to the next person to talk about letters of recommendation. So uh, just to add one thing about testing, um, there's also for SAT, at least when I took it, SAT subject test. Um, and usually there'll, there'll be like chemistry, physics, math. Um, not all colleges require it, but you know, certain like special programs like BSMD programs will sometimes require it. So best thing is if you're interested, check out their website because they'll put all that stuff there. Um, so you're prepared. Um, uh, I think we've talked a lot about extracurriculars and leadership um, already, so I'll jump to letters of recommendation. So everyone will get at least one letter of recommendation from your guidance counselor. And usually the point of that letter is to situate you within your class. And so um, earlier we mentioned taking uh, difficult classes. So your guidance counselor will like lay out what you had access to kind of, and then what you took. So that's why it's really important to try to take a, like the challenging classes at your school. And you also have letters of recs from your teachers. Um, at, you know, pick like a core class teacher, like history, science, math, um, and so, and social studies uh, and English. Uh, so 
Uh, the thing there, though, is that usually it's recommended that you ask like an upperclassman teacher. And um, so I would mostly recommend like junior year because um, you can ask them at the end of your junior year. That gives them a really good amount of time to write a letter for you, or you could uh, possibly wait until the beginning of your senior year. But it's always nice as a courtesy to give your teachers a lot of time to write the best letter they can for you. Um, when trying to pick uh, who you're going to ask, I would say, you know, you know your relationship with your teacher the best. Um, so say you take the same teacher for like two classes or for multiple years, they're good. Say you did really great in their class, obviously they'll be able to recommend you. If they're involved with something, say like your science teacher is also the advisor on the science club that you're the president of, like they would be able to talk a lot about like other quality that you have besides just being like a good student. Um, so uh, yeah, and then you can also get letters of rec from other people. So if you have a job and you think that they could write a good letter on your behalf, you can ask them. What I tried to do, I think I got about three teachers to write my letters of rec for me. I would say, um, you know, we have very limited spot um, to showcase things on the Common App. So try to think of teachers who can tell different things about you. So, you know, even like different subjects. I asked a French teacher because that was kind of way different from the other classes that I took. Um, so that's mainly about letters of REC. And uh, similarly, like as I was talking about the SAT subject test, some schools will specifically want it from a science teacher or a math teacher. So again, like look those things up so that you're uh, prepared. I'll pass it on to uh, the panelists talking about duties. Thanks. Yeah. And just one more thing I thought of for the letter of rec. Um, sometimes the colleges will say like what type of letter that they want you to, um, or sometimes they'll say like, we prefer to get one letter from a teacher who's in an area like relating to your major and one from an area that's not relating to your major. And sometimes they just say any two is fine or sometimes they say one and you know, it, it's college to college. So make sure to look at that too. Um, but yeah, I'm also going to be talking about interviews. So, First of all, the interview itself is just one way of differentiating students. So this isn't like, it's not the most important thing in the world, the application. It's just an extra optional aspect of the application. And, you know, the interviews are really good for places, especially with a lot of stellar applicants, because it's another way of, you know, getting to, I guess, no differences between them. And like, you know, it, it gives them more size. Um, one also another thing about the interview is like don't worry about this option until you get to it because most places don't even offer interviews especially places with like a lot of applicants and even the places that do do interviews don't like contact everyone because they just don't have enough time to get to everybody so don't stress too much about this if like you're you know if you're like a freshman to a junior and even if you're a senior um you know don't worry too much about this like until it comes up or you know your college does interview so um, on with the interview, um, basically they just want to get to know you and like they want to make sure the college is a good fit for you, you're a good fit for the college. So like the most important thing in an interview is to just be yourself because that's what they're looking for. And like, that's what they make their questions. That's what they try to get their questions to do. Like they try to make their questions so that it reveals more about you. Um, yeah, so my general tips is don't worry about this until you have the option and you know, don't worry in general because Essentially, you're just being yourself, so you just be honest about like, you know, what you like, what you think about yourself. Um, another tip is decide what you want them to know about you. So like special abilities, like your background or personality traits, don't be cliche about that. Uh, things that make you unique, things you've done to further your interests or stuff like that. So like, yes, you want to be yourself, but you know, you also want to make sure that they're, they're seeing like the best version of yourself possible. And um, in the two interviews that I did, I only had two they asked me, is there anything particular that you want to tell me? So um, this might be a possibility where like you can show them or tell them um, stuff that like you want to tell them about. 
Also, you know, try to be polite and smile because it makes a, a better impression. And finally, uh, prepare for general questions, like, you know, like biggest strength and weakness, where do you see yourself later in the future? Why this school? But don't rely on it too much because um, one of my interviews I did, I had like almost none of these general questions and most places to do the interviews have unique questions. So in general, um, the interview is just just to get to know you better, just make sure to be yourself. Um, a little bit of preparation beforehand is good, you know, what you want them to know about you, but don't stress too much, you know, because first of all, you might not even get, like, you might not even do an interview if the college doesn't offer it. And second of all, like, you're just being yourself. There's a couple of questions we got in the chat. So um, one is, do you have to send all of your ACT slash SAT scores to colleges? I don't know if anyone could take that one. Um, I actually had something to say about that. Um, as someone who applied during COVID, um, they give you options. Of course, you self-report or you can, um, when you're going to the ACT and ST website, you can select, um, I, I forgot which one, but there's a limit and one doesn't have a limit um, of which colleges you want to send to. And also because of um, COVID, a lot of uh, these schools have given like the freedom and like the option if, if you, want to send your scores and that also follows up with your common app essay i know some schools require it but schools that don't um, give you the option before, right before you send it and ask do you want to send your essay or do you just not even want to show them and i wanted to bring this up because i personally i had i had sent all my test scores out and i know some people didn't um and recently i had um, started doing my class scheduling process with fall and because I had sent out my scores, they were able to automatically automatically place me in a math in a math class because they knew what my score was and what class would be best for me. And so the people that didn't send the score either had to take the time to do that, like in that moment, like in the summertime, or they had to take a placement test. So um, if you're not thinking about sending your score, just be wary that you might like your child might have to take a placement test. Um, before they actually start. Another question, how many times can you retake the SAT? Um, as far as I know, uh, and this was what it was like two years ago when I was going through the college admissions process, uh, typically you're not supposed to take it anything more than three times because if you're taking it more than three times, colleges are like, you're gaming the score. Um, and so I'd say keep it to three or lower, but you're allowed to take it as many times as you want. Um, but yeah. Okay. and then. Uh, Abe, can you talk? Abe, can you talk about your extracurricular activities? Um, yeah, I think that'll take a little bit of time. So, uh, if you want, like, I, I can talk about that later in my deep dive room. But let's just uh, move on to the next question. Okay. And then, uh, how frequent are interviews for college? Yeah. So, um, interviews aren't very frequent. Like, you know, especially if you're applying to like big schools, they don't have enough time to like interview like all of their applicants. So. Um, it's not very frequent. I'm trying to think. Like, I think I applied to like 15 colleges and I had like two interviews. And, you know, that itself was kind of a lot. So it's not very frequent is the bottom line. Uh, okay, so thank you for the questions. We'll move on to um, choosing colleges, which is a big decision and can be kind of like uncertain at the very beginning. Um, so generally, uh, we have like a three system kind of approach, which is safety, target, and reach. So basically what it means is you wanna have some colleges that are safety um, and some that are target, some that are reach. And you normally determine this by looking at the average standardized test scores or average GPA of that college um, and then sort your colleges. It's really important to have a balance um, uh, the holistic process makes it great that you know you can put in all the different things you've had, but it also can make it a bit unpredictable into like where you can get in. It's important to have all three of these. Um, so some factors to consider when you're looking at college. First of all, you want to make sure that um, you'll get what you want, obviously, from the college. So does it have the opportunities to, that you want, like internships? um research extracurriculars um you want to look at like what is the curriculum like so some colleges 
have like a core curriculum where you have to do like English or math or something. Others are more flexible and that also makes it easier if you want to do multiple majors, for example. Um, uh, another uh, factor to consider obviously is cost. I mean, we'll be talking about scholarships later, but uh, think about is it worth for what you have in mind, especially if you're considering like, you know, law school or med school, which will also be a lot of money afterwards. So you want to think about that kind of decision um, and, you know, look into what kind of scholarships they offer. Um, you also want to think about location. So personally, I'm from Louisiana and I'm now in Baltimore and it's a big um, weather change. So, you know, and these things do affect you. You think that it won't, but it will. Um, or also like, is it urban or rural? Um, what kind of class size? So, you know, usually the freshman classes will be big, but from that, like a state school might be a larger class size. There's some private schools that have, um, you know, a smaller class size. So you wanna check that out. Um, also, you know, sometimes what kind of students? Are they all like local students or is it like a very diverse body with like international students? Um, you know, it's whatever you want, but it's like different factors to consider. Um, and overall value, uh, basically, do you see yourself doing well in that college? So I kind of think that you could do well in any college um, because there will be people that you will, you know, vibe with and do well with. Um, but a great thing is to just go check out the college. And if you can't check out all the colleges you're applying to, definitely after you get accepted to a college, like check it out before you, you know, commit to it because you'll see like how the classes are, how the students are. If you can meet any students, they're great resources. Um, and also, like all this research has an extra level of helpfulness because you can incorporate what you learn um, into your college essays, especially if they ask, like, why this college essay? You have all this material about why you want to go to the college. Um, I will uh, turn it over for choosing a major. Yeah, so uh, right before we get to that, um, uh, so we're going to answer all of your guys' questions in the Q&A session, uh, so the ones you can't get to in the chat. And then, um, yeah, but just keep the questions coming. We'll answer all of them in the general Q&A. I think the most important thing when you're choosing a major is, number one, like what you want to do in your career. If you already know what that is going to be, then um, it's going to be a lot easier in terms of like narrowing down what sorts of majors would be best for that. Um, if you don't know, that's also okay. College is a great time to explore. There's so many different options out there. So I would just suggest trying a lot of different classes, learning a lot about different careers um, and trying to choose what's best for you. Um, and yeah, so I can talk a little bit about, uh, about myself. So I'm a pre-med, but uh, like, as you may know, like, just being pre-med isn't a major, like you can study whatever you want. So I ended up majoring in, I'm ending up majoring in Spanish. Um, obviously I'll still be studying biology and like other related subjects along the way. But for me, it was really important to learn a foreign language. And I also, and with that, I also ended up studying a lot of things that I personally really enjoy, like um, social studies topics, like history, culture, that sort of thing. Um, so it's really individualized, do what's best for you. Um, what's going to help you most in the future, and also what you really enjoy. How did you decide what college to go to? What factors did you consider when making that choice? Um, I know as I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, what major I wanted to go into, I knew I wanted to go something arts-based, I wanted, I wanted to go into that field, I just didn't know what. And so um, it took a lot of research. It, it was months of research just trying to find even a major name that interested me. Um, and when I finally found what I really wanted to do, um, I only found two schools that kind of offer that. And that was Purdue University, which I will be attending, and um, Savannah College of Art and Design. Um, and so I chose Purdue because, you know, it has a good name. And there was also, considering my major, they had industry level equipment 
and teachers that were part of the industry. So I knew I'd be getting a high quality level of education. Um, and also personally, I really need, like it's, it's something I need, I need to be integrated in a diverse community. I need to be around a lot of people. And that was something, that was a preference I had in my school. And I know Purdue has like 44,000 students. So that, that's a large body and I knew um, they have a giant Indian community. So I knew it would be really easy for me to fit in. And also one thing I knew they had in specific that you can check um, in the colleges um, that you're applying to. I know a lot of colleges have it. Um, you can go through their page and I know Purdue had a page where it had all the majors that they have and what the future income is for the Purdue alumni. So um, I knew that I would be making a lot if I had graduated from the school. So that was also one of like the pulling factors. And yeah, that's why I chose that school. And along with choosing a college to um, all the panelists really, how did COVID affect your application process? Yeah, so um, I just so I just graduated high school. So um, I think this applies to me. Oh, it did apply to me. Um, but this didn't affect me. Well, like uh, COVID affected the application process because it made a lot of colleges test optional. And um, that means you don't have to submit an SAT or ACT score. And I guess that didn't directly affect me because I planned on submitting my SAT score anyways. But um, it did, I know it did affect other people and it did affect like, the amount of people that applied because since they're test optional now, a lot more people apply to these colleges. And so like, it was a little bit harder to get in. And um, I guess like, you know, the decision dates got moved back a little bit. Um, but like one positive effect is, um, I remember at the beginning, like in quarantine, I had a little bit more time and like more online opportunities to learn about colleges because um, all the colleges did like the same thing because like when people couldn't visit their campuses anymore, they just like spam the virtual tours and like virtual information sessions. And like I went to like all of them. And I think that's like a lot of those opportunities that, you know, that they ramped up back then um, are still present. So like um, I think you can still go and find a lot of these virtual opportunities just on their websites. Yeah, especially quarantine, it provided more time for me personally to spend more time on essays and really just researching each college. And they also had like virtual visits, which was helpful because we couldn't travel. And there were also, like I said, there were more applicants. So that also made the acceptance rates lower. But yeah, COVID kind of just um, affected the application process in the sense that the colleges had more virtual systems in place. So um, I had one more question about that. What do you think were three factors that you believed helped you with the admission process? Uh, yeah, I can answer that. Um, so I would say like, I feel like a lot of times you hear like, you should be unique and like, you know, you might think like, well, you know, like I'm a typical student, um, so what should I talk about? And so I think it's really important just to lay out all the things that you've done, promise you that there's no other applicant who's the exact same. Um, it was even true between me and Priya and Ritwin. So uh, just talk about what you have done. Um, with that said, some things that I think helped me um, was that I was really, dedicated to the clubs that I was in. So I like for the clubs that I was in, I was either in it for like all of high school or like three or two years. I um, mean, that really shows that you're someone who's willing to like stick through and it usually um, will result in like a leadership position or something. So if you find some, something like freshman year that you like, try to stick to it because it shows that you're committed. Um, and then also like as far as leadership and initiative, you know, like they're also looking for students that are going to make their campus better. So if you show that you're willing to, you know, step outside of your comfort zone and lead something or take the initiative on something like that's really like a powerful thing and definitely something, you know, like they also want their students You know, they want to be able to brag about their students as well. So um, they look for those. And of course, I can't go without saying coursework. So 
I took a lot of coursework um, specific like to STEM uh, because I'm a pre-med major, but I also try to take some interesting classes um, that are not necessarily STEM like French, just to show that like I have diverse interests um, and it also like makes you um, able to like, you know, show different interests and see how you could fit into like various clubs or organizations on campus beyond just um, what you're doing. And a lot of things these days, I think, are multidisciplinary. So showing your interest is good. That doesn't mean you have to go join everything, just join like two or three things that you are passionate about, um, even if they're like wildly different. So that's my my three things that I think. So just to recap, because I know I said a lot, it's involvement, uh, initiative or leadership, and then your coursework, because that backs up what you say that you're interested in. Thank you. I can add to that too. Um, so something I would really suggest doing, especially with the school specific essays, um, really dial down and do your research about the specific programs that they have there because they, the schools really like to see that you did your research and you know what you're going to do when you get on campus. So, for example, Tulane has this thing called Birken Road Reports where students will go do like financial research and, and manage a fund of local companies, uh, local publicly traded companies. And I wrote about that in my essay in my Y2 lane essay, um, that that was something I had been looking at for a long time. So every college has a bunch of different things that are unique and specific to that college. So just do your research first and write about that because they really like it. For my supplement essay, um, like you said, when they know that you've done your research, they know that you pay attention to their website. That's really something that's eye catching. I remember for one of my essays, my supplemental essays, I had take, I had read something on their page under my major and I had used the, like almost the exact same wording. So they're like, oh, she definitely went to our website. Um, and also, like I said before, this, these essays they give, they're giving it for a reason. So it's a chance for you to show your voice. They need to know who you are and um, what makes you different from everyone else. And so, for example, in one of my supplemental essays, it asked me um, why I was going into this major. And so I went, I wrote this paragraph about how I had, I had started editing when I was nine years old and I, I've been doing it ever since. And um, I, um, like Parvati said, it's good to show that you're multifaceted. So yes, I'm going to this art major, but I, I wrote about the graphs I would use on editing programs and how that was similar to the graphs I was learning in math class. And um, I, I intertwined that. And so I showed like all these sides of me um, and it just makes you more three dimensional, it makes you a lot more interesting. So yeah, I, if there's anything I have to emphasize, it's that use your, those essays and your common essays um, to your benefit. So academically, college is a pretty big gap from high school. Um, you'll probably see right away when you go into college, uh, a lot of your classes are going to be held way differently than high school. Your tests are gonna be in a different format. Um, maybe in high school, you were used to like multiple choice or shorter answer questions. In college, you're gonna have pretty much all short answer exams. They're gonna be a lot more difficult and you're gonna to have to really try and figure out your study habits. So one thing I would um, really want to point out is treat your first semester in college as experimental. You're going to have to reevaluate your study habits and you shouldn't be discouraged necessarily if your first few exam scores aren't exactly what you want them to be. Um, because like I said, college is going to be, it, there's, there's going to be a huge difference um, from what you're used to. So don't get hung up on grades. Um, obviously, they may be important for the track that you're part of, but treat your first semester like an experiment. Go through it, try and change whatever study habits you have, try and take your tests with different strategies and take each one as feedback. And that way you can kind of figure out and 
um, evolve your, your studying habits to get your college performance level up. And another thing that's really important is uh, time management. When you're in college, you're gonna have to pretty much create your entire schedule yourself. Um, you're not gonna have any anybody there to remind you of when to do things, what. And you're gonna have to keep track of not only all your classes, all your deadlines, but also club activities, uh, whenever you have to do those, um, like social activities, you're gonna have to plan all of that out for yourself. So something that's really uh, useful um, for me was um, like keeping an agenda because that really keeps you in check. If you can get a to-do list of every single thing that you have to do for a day, every day, and write down your deadlines for classes when you have them, that really helps you and it keeps you in line. And um, that way you can get your time management skills up. And that's a really important skill that you need, not just for college, but, um, but for life. Um, and uh, if agendas aren't necessarily like a thing that works for you, I know some people have like a calendar, like Google Calendar or like a like notes on your phone reminders, um, just anything like that that can keep you in check with the deadlines and the um, projects that you have to do because that's really important and it's it's very easy in your first first year first semester to get overwhelmed with all the stuff that's coming at you. Um, so I think it's really important to keep uh, keep your uh, deadline straight um and one last thing is just um i know a lot of people going into college have a sort of um fear of asking for help um and that this is kind of a segue into the next point which i will hand off soon but um some people kind of have a fear of asking for help and i just want to say that you shouldn't let your pride stop you from wanting uh, access to resources college is hard it's going to be difficult and you're not in it alone you shouldn't feel like you can't rely on help to get to your top performance um it's going to be challenging for sure but if you can kind of get over that that pride and go ahead and ask for resources it's a really really helpful tool that your college gives you and that will really help your academic performance in college so yeah now i can hand it off to uh um resources yeah so you get to college you start your classes and you realize like okay maybe i need to reach out for help um so kind of like shreya was saying it's really important to use the resources that you have available to you in your college. They're obviously gonna vary depending on where you go, but one of the most reliable resources you can count on are teaching assistants. So um, teaching assistants are usually people who have already taken your course. Um, it depends on the class. I've had TAs where, or I've had classes with only one TA or six TAs. So it really depends on the size of your class. Um, but the great thing about teaching assistants is that they have most likely already taken that course. So that means they can give you plenty of tips about how to study for this course, what works well, what doesn't work well, and they can also give you tips for studying for exams. Um, a lot of these TAs will also have review sessions, so you can go kind of get your questions answered or just learn about whatever they're talking about for that week. Um, I've been to plenty, I'm sure everyone here has gone to plenty of TA sessions in their day. Um, but they are a super helpful resource. The other great thing about TAs is that they are students. So unlike your professors, they also know what it's like to have to balance the student life with being a college student who just got here, right? Like who's just now experiencing what it's like to transition into college. So they are also a great resource outside of academics to talk to about like the transition into college or certain clubs on campus. They're not just there, or at least in my experience, for academics. They can also help you in your college transition. Um, 
And one other resource I actually wanted to mention that's not listed on here is academic coaching. So some classes or colleges may offer academic coaching. I know my school does. And I know the term like academic coaching might, you might hear that and think like, okay, like I don't need academic coaching. It's not about judgment. It's not about um, saying you're a bad student. I wouldn't call myself a bad student, but I definitely have utilized that resource because their specialty is helping students transition into college and developing new study skills that you may not be familiar with um, for when you arrive in college. So if your school offers that, I would highly recommend um, that that's something else that you check out. Um, but yeah, I'll hand it over to the next person so they can kind of talk about office hours. Hey, um, I think office hours are probably one of the best ways that you can find and find opportunities from professors and also just learn from them and talk with them about their experiences and their career. Because the people that you're gonna be taking these classes from, like these people are at the cutting edge of their fields. And, you know, lecturing students is kind of a side gig for most of them. They, they are at the top of, you know, their, their area. So um, for me, what I, what I did in some of my classes that I found interesting, um, I would just stay after class and just ask literally one question. And, and it doesn't matter, like, if it's a profound question or a simple question, it can be anything. But you just kind of want to get on the professor's radar because like it really it really opens up opportunities like um one of my professors wrote a biography about steve jobs and he he had to interview him for a while um in the 2000s and i, I actually i asked him if he could tell me any cool stories about him um that he that he had to tell and we talked for a while um and at the end it kind of naturally progressed to talking about his class for the next semester, which was really, really hard to get into. Um, it had about like 50, 60 people on the wait list at the time. And I asked him about it and he said, like, yeah, you can just come in, like you're in. So I got to skip that wait list just by asking. And also um, I might, be doing some research too next semester in computer science because again, I asked my professors, um, just, just ask them any questions about themselves. But also, it may not always work out. Um, last year, I asked a professor to do some research and he, he said he, he would interview me, but um, he never got back to me. And it's, it's fine because all I, all I did was just emailed him and I didn't really lose anything. So I think Shreya mentioned this before, um, like once you get rid of that like stigma of just asking, um, that opens up a lot of opportunities for you. And you know, you should do that early and start asking as soon as possible. Um, we can talk about tutoring organizations. Um, so uh, most of it, Sonia has already mentioned. I just wanted to um, let you know that like there's different types. So like at my college, like we have um, like TAs, and but they're usually like graduate students, and then we have like separate things that are run by um, the undergrad students. And there's also like you can drop in just for like homework help or something. The main thing I want to emphasize is like, you know, try to just like try these out as a freshman. Um, you know, everyone's kind of confused freshman year and it's the perfect time to just kind of explore those things and like make the necessary changes so that you can go into your sophomore year, you know, feeling more prepared and ready um, for classes. And um, the, there's something that my, me and my peers always talk about, which is that Freshman year is really hard, and sophomore year you think will be easier, and it tends to be just as hard uh, because the classes are harder, but you are now smarter. So try to take advantage of what you have um, freshman year, and I'll set you forward for your remaining years. 
Um, uh, I will also be talking about general life skills. And the main thing I want to talk about is stress management. And I think it really ties with time management, as Shay was talking about. So um, I, I don't know about you, but I love having a routine because I know that I won't miss anything. And you'll be surprised. I think the main change from high school to college is that you have so much control over your time. And also that like everyone around you is probably not doing the same thing. So it's not like you're going to go to classes with your friend and, you know, have like a set like schedule. And like, you know, if you join extracurriculars, that also happens at all times of the day. It's really important if you want to stay calm and be able to go with the flow, you need to have that kind of schedule um, set in. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's really important to not forget to enjoy yourself. So, um, you know, if you want to join extracurricular that really that you enjoy, like that is a hobby, like cooking or playing an instrument or volunteering, if that gives you joy, um, do those things. Um, and it's really also important to self reflect, which you already talked about, but I also think um, one thing I like to think about is, um, especially like in terms of stress or whatever, is like, what is something, you know, what is that one thing that's giving you stress and think of strategies of how you want to deal with it. So it could be that um, you have like so much on your plate. So a good thing is to either like, you know, evaluate what things you want to continue, um, what things you might want to put on hold. But I think Thinking of it um, as like, you know, a growth mindset um, uh, and any like, you know, anything that happens that is like not ideal, don't ever like think bad about it. I think you should always think of it as a lesson for future use um, uh, because, you know, college is unpredictable and it's definitely hard. And so um, all you can do is take those lessons that you learn. Um, also, this is very important with COVID, but in general, like, remember to stay healthy. So if you're going to, like, be eating from that, like, freshman, like, canteen, like, make sure you get all your nutrients. Um, it's something that people forget, but you need, like, get a green leafy vegetable or whatever in your diet. Um, it's helpful. So I'll, um, we can move on to changing major or track. When I applied to college, I actually um, applied as a journalism major and somehow ended up being biology pre-med um, with an environmental studies major as well. Um, so every school is going to have a different process. I had kind of been, been debating between different um, majors before I applied to college. So like I said, I applied as a journalism major and Right before we got to college, I kind of started having clarity more about what I wanted to do. And I realized that maybe journalism is not for me. So um, the best way to go about changing your major or track, I think, is to sit down with an advisor from the major that you're thinking about changing to. Um, the reason that this can be helpful is they can help you kind of lay out a track for what it's going to look like moving forward. So I kind of had to change my registration. I had to change the classes I was taking, and that changed what every semester was going to look like moving forward. Um, so you definitely want to take into consideration. I know some people who have changed majors multiple times. That's OK. But every time you change majors, you're going to have to change your track. You're going to have to change your future semesters. And for some people, that might mean adding on extra semesters um, before they can graduate. But I would say it's better to do a few extra semesters than a lifetime of something that you don't want to do, right? Um, but for us personally, we just have to do, as ridiculous as it sounds, a Google form after meeting with our um, advisors, and then you submit that and they go ahead and contact you about changing your major. Um, I will say it's definitely easier to change major within the same school. So I changed majors within our College of Humanities and Sciences. So it was a little easier versus if I wanted to change from the College of Humanities and Sciences to something like the College of Engineering. Um, it just looks a little bit different for every single school. But the number one thing that I can emphasize 
is making sure that that's what you want to change to and making sure you know what that's going to entail moving forward. Um, you don't want to keep changing and realize that you haven't met any requirements for any of the majors that you're interested in. Um, but a lot of schools will make sure that if you come in as undecided, especially that you're taking kind of general courses that are going to cover what you need for a lot of different majors. So how did you guys choose your major specifically? When I came into college, I didn't think that I was going to be majoring in Spanish at all. Um, I thought I would be taking psychology and philosophy classes of all things. Um, but then that changed and that's okay. Um, and I was in my Spanish classes and I saw how much I was enjoying it, how much, how different it was from my high school Spanish classes and all the different opportunities that I was getting through them. So that's what, that's what turned out right for me. So I'm a, a molecular and cellular biology major, but I'm also a public health major. Um, and I think we kind of touched on it before, but like when you pick your major, it should be like you, if you have an idea of what you want to do after college, like, you know, you can definitely think about that when picking a major, but also like think about what you would actually enjoy. Um, I think that's the sort of beauty of college that like after some prerequisites, you really get to go deep into that subject. Um, so for me, like I liked the, since I took two majors, I liked the compliment, like the biology major really has given me a good understanding of sort of like basic biology principles and like things on a very like small molecular cellular uh, level. And then the public health has really, it's very different in terms of requirements and it's really like community and like large social and cultural factors. So I really like the complement of the two and I really liked all the classes I've taken in them. So one thing is, as we were talking about, like if you were changing majors, that does happen because often in college, in high school, you don't get to really understand what a subject means. So you might think you want to be like a chemistry major and then when you start doing it, you feel like, oh, this is not what I thought chemistry was or, you know, it's not what you actually want to continue doing. So it's really good to, um, it's okay if you have to change when you start, but it's really good to sort of like when you're, when you, and this is not even just for majors, but in general in college, it's really nice to like find some upperclassmen um, and really get their insight, whether it be on classes later on, on clubs or anything like that. Um, they can sort of give you, um, they're very approachable and they can give you a more realistic view of like what you'll be doing going forward. Um, and if you don't know what you're doing, then there's a lot of sort of prereqs slash like in our college, they do like seminars, which are good ways for people to like explore subjects and see if that's really what they want to do. Yeah, for sure. And completely agree with Priyar. I think that it's really important to be able to find those like mentors. So I'm an electrical engineering computer science major over at Berkeley. And like, for me, at least what I think a lot of computer science majors come to is this the only thing that you want to do. I think it's a little bit different than the pre-med track because at least with pre-med, you have a lot broader of an area where you can go into medicine from. Whereas with computer science, it's a little bit harder to go into computer science unless you have that initial thing. But what I see is that a lot of people are able to come in undecided and decide within two years. So a lot of public schools, um, they let you declare into programs they didn't initially apply for. So a lot of kids will apply undeclared to certain schools. And so there's this big majority of kids inside of the College of Arts and Sciences, which is essentially the College of Communities um, that Sonia was talking about at every single school to have like that big undecided batch. And you really get that opportunity to explore the different major opportunities. And that's really a great time to explore all these different routes, right? So certain private schools, will have a lot more of an emphasis on getting that liberal arts curriculum. And so they'll have like in Chicago, they have like the core curriculum Well, they make every single kid, whether you're an engineer, whether you're doing history, whether you're doing math, they make them all take these same core classes. But at public schools, you'll see that they'll force them into more specific tracks. And so that really depends on what you're more interested in. If you want that more of a broad experience, then it makes sense to apply to the College of Communities because it'll be easier to switch. But if you know more of what you want to do, then apply to the College of Engineering, the College of Architecture, those kind of things lock you into the track more, but then they also make it a lot easier to take the classes that you want to take if you know what you want to take when you're applying during high school. Okay, one thing I would like to start off is that I know a lot of people, they think of research, might think of like what's called wet lab research, which is like either like, you know, making solutions for chemistry or like 
pipetting for biology. But the truth is you can do research in literally any uh, subject. The thing about research is so depending on your major, certain majors, it will be like a requirement. So for example, in my biology requirement, I need like six credits of research um, with someone doing biology research. And like, so at Hopkins, you could do it with the biology department. You could do it with the neuroscience department. You could do it with the School of Medicine or the School of Public Health. It really depends. Another thing is, so for research, um, I think uh, I just mentioned this earlier, the real, like the way that a lot of people do it is kind of like a cold email to the professor. So, you know, whatever kind of research you're interested in, go into that like department page, look through the faculty, look at what kind of research they're doing and then send them an email. And, you know, you want to put a little bit of your own effort to show that you're dedicated. So, you know, you can like go through maybe their most recent paper. You don't have to understand anything, like all of it. You can understand just bits and pieces. But you can be like, see, I saw this and it was really interesting. Um, would it be, do you have like a research position open for undergrad, undergraduate students? And they love, most professors love having undergrad students with them and teaching them and helping mold their career. So they'll, you know, agree. Um, but also, as I just mentioned, professors are really busy you do might have to reach out to many people, but um, be assured that there will be someone who will be interested in working with you. Also, you know, it's not necessary just to do research during the school year. If you think that you already have a lot on your plate, um, a lot of times there's great research opportunities um, during the summer. And, you know, sometimes that's really good because you can spend like a dedicated amount of time every day on your research. And, you know, um, that's really good. You can even do it like, you know, if you go to one college, you can do a research thing somewhere else. Um, and if you're like thinking of grad school or something, that might be a great position for you to be in because you'll know about another school that does great research. One difference between high school and college is that there's going to be a ton of extracurricular opportunities available for you and tons of student organizations. A lot of schools will have hundreds of different groups that you can get involved with so i would recommend like as soon as you enter college so it'll usually be an activities fair or something like that where you can go and check out a bunch of these things um and i would recommend just doing whatever interests you and whatever will give you community and also will give you connections to other students who are doing similar things to you um and who like like clubs within which you'll there will be lots of students who can give you advice who have very recently been through what you're going through. So that looks like professional fraternities or like pre med pre law like art clubs, things like that. Uh, I would recommend getting involved with clubs that are involved around in the community. Um, if that's something you're interested in, just to learn a little bit more about the place you're in, if it's different from the place you grew up in, um, and that can also open your eyes to a lot of different opportunities that you're not going to know about by just looking stuff up online. So I have one more question. Um, what, uh, what, like, what are you guys involved in on campus and how did you guys get involved? Um, so I have been involved in a pre-med group, um, which has been really great. Uh, I got to meet a lot of upperclassmen as a freshman that really helped me in terms of planning classes and, and choosing extracurriculars and basically everything. So I would recommend joining things like that if you can. Uh, and then I'm also involved in um, a South Asian like political action slash discussion group, which has been really great to help me work on issues that I care about um, while also finding community. Um, so, and then I, I'm also involved in different volunteering things around the city, which have also changed throughout the pandemic. But um, yeah, just look for what's open to you. Um, I also tutor. Uh, yeah, there are tons of different opportunities in college. So whatever you want to do, you can do it. And even if for whatever reason, like that club isn't there at your college, like for example, um, I was interested in learning dance, but uh, a lot of the Indian dance clubs at my school were all competitive and high level and I was not there. 
So I got together with some of my friends um, and we started a small club ourselves. And that's also a great way to meet new people. Okay, so we got a couple of questions about scholarships and um, I'm just gonna go ahead and talk about some of them that will be available to you. So there are merit scholarships as well as need-based scholarships. Um, one scholarship that if you're taking the PSAT um, that is available is the National Merit Scholarship. So there are, as you can see on the slide, plenty of entries. It goes down to semifinalists, finalists, and um, there are around 7,000, upwards of 7,000 of these scholarships. Um, and all the amounts are listed there, but there's definitely a lot of information that you can find out with the link that's on the slide, but um, we can worry about going through all of this later. I know you guys are eager to start asking your questions. Um, but yeah, so that's one thing definitely to look out for if you're planning on taking the PSAT. Um, my school and high school required us to take it, and so that automatically qualifies you um, to be entered for that. Um, we also have other merit-based scholarships that are available um, you know, at your college or through other um, through other programs. So like everyone was talking about, there's that holistic approach, right? They're still evaluating you based on that holistic approach. And um, for, for me, especially like a lot of these merit-based scholarships will be offered through you automatically through your application. So I didn't have to do anything separate at my school to apply for a merit-based scholarship. Um, when I got my acceptance letter, I was also awarded with my scholarship. And um, if you want to, you're more than welcome to call the counselors at that school or even speak to your own counselors in your high school to find out more about those merit-based scholarships. And all that is, is a scholarship based on your academic performance or your leadership performance. Um, it can be based on different things. And there is a link that we'll share with you later in the resources that um, goes over some good places to find merit-based scholarships. A lot of them are school-specific. So for example, UVA has something called the Jefferson Scholarship, which is a scholarship that basically pays for your entire um, college experience. Um, I know, I think Duke has a similar one and there are other ones offered through companies like the Coca-Cola um, Scholarship is a pretty um, popular scholarship that a lot of people um, apply to. And I think the award is around $20,000. So that's a really good one to apply to if, if you're interested in merit-based scholarships. Um, that being said, there's also financial aid available. Um, paying for college is not easy. It's obviously very expensive here. So there are financial aid packages. Um, you can definitely apply through FAFSA and the, your CSS profile. I would highly recommend that if you're interested in um, receiving financial aid that you use these programs. Um, most or all schools also have financial aid counselors available. So I've heard of people meeting with or calling their financial aid counselors and kind of petitioning for a higher reward. So say you get to a school, their financial aid package isn't necessarily what you were hoping for. You can always petition based on the financial aid you received at another school or you can just kind of be like, hey, I'm really interested in your school, but I am just not able to afford it with this much financial aid. What can you do for me? Sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't, but it never hurts to ask. Um, and the last little bullet on here is, can you apply for scholarships after you get into university? Yeah, you can. So um, it, it, can, it can be a scholarship through the dean or through your departments. So um, I know for our college, we have College of Humanities and Sciences has their own little separate pot of money for scholarships. And so you can find those online. You can talk to your advisors about that. You can talk to your professors about that. Some of them are through recommendation. Um, so yes, if you don't apply for scholarships um, right into your application of high school, you can still do so when you are in college. So now is the time for you guys to ask any questions you guys want and uh, through the chat and we'll just answer them out loud. I have a my ACT account and I'm trying to take the ACT soon. I'm an upcoming sophomore, but I cannot find the testing dates in my local facilities on the website. It won't let me register. How do I register right now for future ACT tests? I think this is because of COVID maybe guys, right? So you guys should be able to call them directly, I think with the 800 number. Um, I don't have a really good answer, but I do know that when I was trying to take an SAT or an ACT test, a lot of the times um, they were getting canceled because of COVID. 
So um, make sure you if, check if you got any emails um, from the testing location saying, hey, we've canceled it. Um, but if you're looking for a location, um, check and see if your high school um, supplies their tests, because I know um, because these tests are really important, uh, my high school offered them and it was actually mandatory to make sure everyone had gotten a test score. So check with your high school and see if they have, have any upcoming dates, usually in like March, where they can provide you with We've got another question. Um, I'm taking several AP exams in my senior year. Will my AP test credits get transferred to the college I'm attending? Um, I can answer this. I know um, I just finished my AP test in like May. Um, and while I was scheduling my fall classes with my advisor, they told us that for as a student, your AP scores will come out at the end of July, but colleges receive it before students see their scores because they know that colleges need to get your scores. So if you take if you took AP courses and the test during your senior year, um, your college will get it before you. And according to that, they should be able to make changes in your schedule before you actually start your test. Another question we have is, is there any ways to easily see all the majors a college offers, either through the Common App or on the Common College's website? I can actually answer this myself because I'm going through the process. Um, a really easy program to use is Big Future from College Board, going there and looking up the colleges that you're interested in. It'll lead you to tabs that have the financial packages that are available, scholarships that are available, and all the majors that you can take at the college, whether or not they have a medical school. All kinds of information is available through Big Future, and the link is bigfuture.collegeboard.org, I think, to get to that website. Uh, I'll just interrupt really quickly. Um, there was a question about like how to start making a college list, so I just put a link in the chat um, by College Board, and it kind of like shows you like the location and major and everything it also says like average SAT score. Um, so just, you know, it's also okay. Like if you make a big list and you want to like narrow it down after doing more research. Um, but yeah, hopefully that is helpful. I would also add here that a great place to start is just with schools from your local state, just because uh, with, you know, your local state schools, they will have lower tuition and often have much higher acceptance rates. So those are often going to be, you know, your safest like target and safety schools. So definitely start there. And um, like Parvati said, make as big of a list as you want to. And then from there, go to their website to learn about, you know, their majors, what student life is like, and then narrow it down from there. And you won't really find information about the schools themselves on the college app, but a great place to ask if you can't find any specific information is uh, your guidance counselor, but 99% of information about the university will be on its website. How important, how important is the number of AP tests? What is a good number of AP credits to get? It doesn't really matter the number. Um, as you were talking about earlier, it kind of depends on how much you had access to. Like some schools just have like all the APs offered and some of them only offer very specific ones. So there's not like a magic number that you need to take. I would say that, um, like think about like what your, why you wanna do that. Like if you're going into STEM, um, it might be like which specific tests, like which specific subjects you would like to have that AP score in. For example, um, if you're going into STEM, it's really helpful to have math credits um, and also like the science classes done. So um, yeah, it's sort of like what you, and if you do know like some colleges that you want to go to, some of them will say like what you get credit for. Um, I know how, I did a lot of like English and history AP classes, but like none of them were expect, accepted at our school. So if that's also something like you're looking for college credit, look at um, you know what some of the colleges that you're interested in would actually accept. Um, also, just like I know some schools don't do too much like AP credit, so. You can also see if they have any like dual enrollment, dual enrollment classes with like a local um, uh, college and like you're also like feel free to also like bring it up with like one of the vice principals. So like my freshman year, I was at a different high school than I was later on, but they didn't have that many AP classes. And um, I asked if they could do like a like a computer science dual enrollment class with LSU, which is like the local university and they like agreed and had it set up. So 
anything you're interested in, bring it up because it's also great for the other students to be a part of and they'll be interested. When would be the best time to take the SAT or the ACT? I always think that, you know, it's good to have some time to prepare. So personally, I did all mine like during the summer. Um, so I had like basically the whole summer to prepare because sometimes during school time can be difficult. Um, so a, a really popular time is either like the end of the summer or like the end of winter break um, because you'll have time before that to study. And usually, so I would try to do it if you can as early as possible. So like I did all my standardized tests my sophomore year. I mean, it kind of depends on like what classes you've taken and if you've taken the right math and all that stuff. But it's always nice, I think, to do it early as possible. So that if you decide to take it over again, um, you can and it reduces the stress on your first attempt because you know you have another chance if you would like to take it. Another note about that is for me at my local high school, everyone took the ACT their junior year. Um, and that, you know, could be for many people that was their like one and only time taking it. So for a lot of people, you know, maybe your high school had that and you already took it. But I think this question is going to be better answered by thinking about like the maximum number of times you want to take it. Like we talked about earlier, you don't want to just kind of take it a bunch of times because then it looks worse to colleges that if you keep taking it a bunch of times, and you have like the same score. That looks a lot worse than like taking time to study for it and just like taking it your senior year as long as you get it in you know around the time that your application goes in like you're perfectly fine for a lot of schools like people applied like early in the fall and then took the sat in like you know like january or february and sent those those scores in as well so it's not like an end-all be-all there's no like right answer or wrong answer just you know study as well as you can for it and you know take it whenever you feel comfortable and yeah, as long as you get it in your application, you can indicate that, you know, I've already taken it, I've already taken it, or, you know, I'm planning to take it this time. So that's not too big of a deal. Anukul is asking, my ACT is better than my SAT, but both are above the 75% percentile of my target schools. Is it worth sending both? I can answer this one, and I can also answer the other ACT question that's under that. So um, as I was saying before that I was doing my fall course registration um, recently, and um, I had set my ACT and my uh, my ACT and my SAT score, um, and so they have different criteria of like where is their like benchmark number for placing you in classes like I was saying math class. So I set both because one was higher than the other. Um, I was like on the edge mark and I I had made it, so they had placed me into a higher math class. And so because you don't know where they're cut off is with their scores and how they place you. I think it would be a good idea to send both, but still it's up to you if that's something you're comfortable with. And someone had asked if it's a good idea to take both. Um, I remember when I was studying for both like my freshman year, um, I had felt that the SAT was easier for me. And then um, I started you know, getting into ACT more and I realized that that one I had a much higher score. So, and I've heard, you can like um, talk to other parents. It really, it's based on the child. Like some people it's easier, the SAT is easier for them. Some people, the ACT is easier for them. So when you're doing those practice tests, just see which one you're more comfortable with and which one you think you'll probably get a higher score. There's a question, what's the difference between double major and major minor? Why choose double major? Yeah, Sorry. so the difference between a double major and taking a major and a minor, it's just a difference between the number of classes, the number of credits that you're going to take in that subject. So that's going to be specific to whatever university you're attending. If you look up like what a major entails and what a minor entails, then they'll usually have very clearly something on their website what all the requirements are. So um, what like which one you want to take I think that depends based on what you're interested in and also what kind of field you're going into sometimes people find that double majors do make you more competitive and sometimes um, it doesn't matter also it's important to think about if there are any other classes you want to take um, how that's going to impact your time management throughout college so if there are other classes you need to take like different prerequisites or there are different activities you want to do a double major might be a little bit more difficult to balance while you're doing that so it's important to think about all those factors uh, just yeah. to add to that a great 
thing, I don't know if you mentioned this before, but whenever you are just, if you have a major in mind, like make that four year plan. Um, because, uh, you know, especially if you're choosing two majors that are very different, um, you wanna make sure that you can like physically get that done um, within the four years that you have. Um, so yeah, and usually you can like um, review it with like your counselor, um, during your freshman year and they can like, give you advice on that. Kind of piggybacking off of that, you will probably have a little less flexibility in your schedule if you do choose to go for a double major. So the way it was explained to me is it's like you're walking away with two degrees. If you have two majors, it's like you're walking away with two degrees. Um, but I will say like for my senior year, I'm sure other people who have um, done double majors I've seen like my friends with one major are taking a lot of different electives. They get to choose a lot of different things. Um, whereas I'm still kind of in that phase of fulfilling requirements a little bit. Um, so if you're, if you're worried about not having as much flexibility, um, that's definitely something to consider.